Welcome to the Bogosity Podcast, wrapping up the year 2013. Tick tock goes the clock. This is your host, Shane Killian. Let's look back on the events of the past year and find out who, among all the worthy nominees, is 2013's Idiot of the Year. There was a victory, however small, for sense and rationality. Although it's been known for many, many years that it's impossible for cell phones and other consumer electronic devices to interfere with an airplane's systems, up until now, it's been illegal. As we covered, the FAA is now allowing personal electronic devices other than cell phones on airplanes, and the FCC is relaxing their restrictions on cell phones as well. And now, apparently in a last-ditch effort to get Idiot of the Year, the Republican Party is opposing it. Because they're all for free markets, you know. And what's their argument? Well, at least they're not arguing that it interferes with the aircraft's instruments, which it doesn't. They're not even arguing that crap about quickly switching between cell towers, which the mobile companies are perfectly capable of policing themselves. No, their argument is, it's rude to talk on a plane. Yep, that's it. Additionally, the Association of Flight Attendants supports the restriction because of the risk of, quote, air rage. I kid you not. Guys, stop crowding! Only one of you can be idiot of the year! Do we need this law in movie theaters? No, we don't. Theaters set their own policies regarding this and show a brief film telling people to shut off their cell phones before the main feature begins. There's no reason to think the same thing wouldn't work on board a plane. The restrictions wouldn't extend to texting, browsing, or checking email, so at least there's that. But the idea that we need government to stop annoying cell conversations on a plane? That we need to stop air rage? This is a solution looking for a problem. Really, the best comment in all of this came from FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler. Quote, I do not want the person in the seat next to me yapping at 35,000 feet any more than anyone else. But we are not the Federal Courtesy Commission. Right on, Wheeler. We also have people from the forums making their own nominations for Idiot of the Year, and this one comes from T-Dog, and is none other than your favorite wacky time-traveling economist and mine, Paul Krugman, with his essay, Bitcoin is Evil. Need I say more? I think not. But I will anyway, you know me. Quote, So far, almost all of the Bitcoin discussion has been positive economics. Can this actually work? And I have to say that I'm still deeply unconvinced. To be successful, money must be both a medium of exchange and a reasonably stable store of value and it remains completely unclear why Bitcoin should be a stable store of value. You mean, as opposed to small green pieces of paper with a picture of a dead guy on them? Hey, the dollar isn't even that anymore. For the most part, it's just numbers in computers. Very few dollars ever get actually printed as bills or minted as coins. So really, all we're doing is comparing one virtual currency with another. So what's the difference? Krugman quotes Brian DeLong in saying there are two reasons why. One, you can pay your taxes with it, and two, the Fed has promised to buy dollars back if inflation gets too bad. And we all know what the promise of politicians are worth. Hey, isn't this the same Federal Reserve that promised it wouldn't inflate the money supply after the financial crisis and then created over $16 trillion between late 2008 and early 2011? Actually, there is one big advantage one has over the other. Transparency. Bitcoin has it, the Fed doesn't. Notice how Krugman doesn't mention that. As for the economics of it, he supports the words of Charlie Strauss. Bitcoin looks like it was designed as a weapon intended to damage central banking and money issuing banks with a libertarian political agenda in mind to damage states' ability to collect tax and monitor their citizens' financial transactions. Even if that's true, so what? Aww. Krugman feels his widow Fatty Weddy might get hurt. His last paragraph is just hilarious for the fail. Quote, so let's talk about whether Bitcoin is a bubble and whether it's a good thing. You mean like all those times you claimed the housing bubble was a good thing? Yeah, good nomination, t Dog. We'll stick this on top of the other three fails he had this year. Well, for 2014, why not make the resolution to make sound investments? 
You might have a portfolio or retirement account with stocks, bonds, and money markets, but that just isn't enough. You need gold for a fully balanced portfolio capable of holding its own through almost any economic situation. So go to coins.pagosity.tv and you'll be taken to Coinable where you can buy gold or silver coins or bars with dollars or bitcoins. With literally up to the minute spot pricing, get gold and silver from reputable dealers and Coinable even utilizes a special shipping infrastructure to ensure that your investment arrives safely at your door. And you know what? By going to coins.pagosity.tv, you won't pay a penny more or a Satoshi more for your purchase but you'll help this podcast. And you know what? You can even sell your gold and silver as well. So make the New Year's resolution to secure your investments today. Go to coins.pagosity.tv. Now, throughout 2013, we continued our coverage of governments working against the homeless and those trying to feed and shelter them. And just a few weeks ago, it happened again, this time in St. Louis, as a street church that serves hot meals to the homeless after they were featured on the front page of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch praising their good work, was told by the city health department to knock it off. Way to get into the Christmas spirit, guys! The church gave out the food on private property, but that didn't matter to Health Department Supervisor Pat Mahoney, who said, quote, It's because they're serving the public. The moment you start inviting the public to attend, that's when we get into it. And he's not alone. City Health Director Pam Walker concurred, quote, If I want to cook and poison my own family and friends, that's okay. But when you're open to the public, that's implying a certain standard of safety. That's the standard we have in place for all the homeless shelters in the city. See, this is how encroachment happens. It starts out with being on public property, so you move to private property. But now it's because you're serving the public, whoever that is. So St. Louis joins Raleigh, Philadelphia, Orlando, New York City, and many other cities in stopping the homeless from getting meals to protect their health. Yeah. Stay classy, statists. Stay classy. Also jumping into the last minute with an incredibly bogus hit piece was Tyler Lopez of Slate.com. Get this. He claims of the LP.org issues page, quote, Conspicuously absent from the page, any mention of gay rights. This is an outright lie. Here's section 1.3 of the 2012 platform as published on the LP.org website, quote, Sexual orientation, preference, gender, or gender identity should have no impact on the government's treatment of individuals such as in current marriage, child custody, adoption, immigration, or military service laws. Government does not have the authority to define, license, or restrict personal relationships. Consenting adults should be free to choose their own sexual practices and personal relationships. Also, Section 3.5 reads in part, quote, we condemn bigotry as irrational and repugnant. Government should not deny or abridge any individual's rights based on sex, wealth, race, color, creed, age, national origin, personal habits, political preference, or sexual orientation. Okay, that isn't on the particular HTML page that he went to, but I think we all know what that is, right? Cherry picking! In fact, Sexual equality has been in the platform since 1975, when it read, quote, We hold that only actions which infringe on the rights of others can properly be termed crimes. We favor the repeal of all federal, state, and local laws creating crimes without victims. In particular, we advocate the repeal of all laws regarding consensual sexual relations, including prostitution and solicitation, and the immediate cessation of state oppression of homosexual men and women, that at last they be accorded their full rights as individuals. The use of executive pardon to free all those presently incarcerated for the commission of these crimes. It also read, quote, no individual rights should be denied or abridged by the laws of the United States or any state or locality on account of sex, race, color, creed, age, national origin, or sexual preference. We condemn bigotry as irrational and repugnant. By the way, both parts passed at the 1975 convention unanimously. How can he possibly have a problem with that? Listen for yourself. Quote, 
The Libertarian Party's stance on gay rights never left the 1990s. The government should stay out of your bedroom era, which ended with Lawrence v. Texas in 2003, does not empower LGBTQ people outside of the bedroom, and that's exactly where we need to take the fight. In the libertarian view, gay and lesbian marriages are not seen as a committed relationship between two adults, lie, but rather as a step toward ending governmental involvement in marriage altogether. That's not giving gay people equal rights, it's stripping away everybody's rights. What? Getting government out of it is stripping away rights? How far deluded do you have to be to believe that? Also interesting that he chose to use 2008 presidential candidate Bob Barr, the author of DOMA, for the article's picture, who isn't even active in the party anymore. Notice that he didn't use 2012 candidate Gary Johnson, who believes that homosexual rights are federally protected, unlike Barack Obama and most Democrats. Note also that he didn't point out that libertarians are the ones who got Barr to speak against DOMA itself, specifically the group Outright Libertarians. Nope. If you're a liberal who supports gay rights, you just have to lie to yourself and pretend the Democrats are your friend. They aren't, and libertarians are enemy. We're not. Otherwise, the entire stack of lies the Democratic platform is built on collapses like a house of cards. So now let's hear from our co-host Charles Thomas and his nomination for Idiot of the Year. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it is me, Charles Thomas, a.k.a. Duke C.T. or Bagasa T. Podcast. I want to first off, I want to wish everybody a happy holidays, a kick-ass New Year's. Thank you so much, Shane, and shout out to him for letting me be a part of this podcast. Uh, I want to thank Tim Dyson, Dave Picard, uh, uh, you know, all the guys from the Bogosi forums and all the guys on YouTube, Structured Criticisms. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to try to uh, fix my, you know, rambling problem. So, I'm sorry, I'm raised in D.C., so I'm, I mean, I'm used to doing stuff like this and hearing about it with the politicians and such. But uh, anyway, I'm going to make a point about my nomination for Idiot of 2013. The judge in the Ethan Crouch uh, trial. And if you don't know who Ethan Crouch is, he killed four people. He killed a youth pastor, Brian Jennings, Holly Sarah Boyles, and Brent Brenda Mitchell. Brianna Mitchell in a car accident when he was drinking while driving and his alcohol, blood alcohol level, ladies and gentlemen, was .24, three times the legal lima, limit for an adult. Now, some would say this, this is a huge tragedy and the young kid will probably spend the rest of his life in prison. But not the case to judge for whatever brilliant reason decided to give him probation. And the reason why he got away with this, ladies and gentlemen, this this decision is that the the defense actually argued and successfully argued that he has affluenza. So basically his kid has been going off in life, basically not getting any come up into whatsoever. So when the judge finally got into uh, you know when he find this son say he can find get come up and see he doesn't get the come up Yes, ladies and gentlemen. It just shows once again I think I'm quoting Tim Dyson that at the end of the day the people you rail against the rich, this judge just proved that you know what? They're not really with you. But anyway, I'll keep the good fight going. And let's hope that 2014 can be even better. And, uh, well, we keep the idiots at bay. But not all of them, because we need someone to laugh at. Thank you so much. This is Charles Thomas, a.k.a. Duke CT, signing out. Make a New Year's resolution to start that business or get your personalized email address at GoDaddy.com. All of my websites, including Bogosity.tv, are hosted there, and I've been a satisfied GoDaddy customer for over 10 years now. Their prices are great, and I've always had a wonderful experience with their 24-7 support. I've never found any better. I'm never on hold for long, and the first person who answers can always help me. So sign up for any new domain, web hosting, email, or many other services, and get 35% off by typing in the code WOWNOBOGON. That's W-O-W-N-O-B-O-G-O-N. Because there's nothing bogus about these savings on quality internet service. Get a new domain name or email address. Set up that website. Start that online business. And even use GoDaddy's website builder and other design services to get you going in a snap. 
with professional designs on a small business budget. Just go to GoDaddy.com and use the code WOWNOBOGON. Also worming his way in line is Pastor Rick Henderson for his article in Huffington Post entitled, Why There Is No Such Thing As A Good Atheist. Okay, he deserves nomination for the title alone, but let's get to the fail. Quote, Every expression of atheism necessitates at least three additional affirmations. 1. The universe is purely material, it is strictly natural, and there is no such thing as the supernatural, e.g. gods or spiritual forces. Um, no. First of all, there are lots of atheists who believe in the supernatural. Most Buddhists are atheists, for example, because they don't believe in any god, but they do believe in supernatural forces. But for purposes of this takedown, we'll assume he's talking about rational, skeptical atheists. And guess what? It still isn't true. We don't say positively that there's no such thing as the supernatural. It's that nothing supernatural has ever been demonstrated to exist. Big difference. And it's his failure to understand this difference that is at the heart of the rest of the fail. Quote, 2. The universe is scientific. It is observable, knowable, and governed strictly by the laws of physics. Um, no, that's not what it means. There isn't a category of things sciency and not sciency that's inherent to things. Science is a process, a way of examining claims and hypotheses to see whether or not they're true, and it's the only way that's been shown to be reliable. And guess what? If you come up with another way of finding things out that's just as reliable, let us know, and it'll become a part of science. Quote, 3. The universe is impersonal. It does not have a consciousness or a will, nor is it guided by a consciousness or will. Again, wrong. It's that no consciousness or will of the universe, or any consciousness or will guiding the universe, has ever been demonstrated. And he wraps up the fail with his very next sentence, quote, Denial of any one of these three affirmations will strike a mortal blow to atheism. No, it won't. The only thing that will strike a mortal blow to atheism would be evidence for a god or gods, at which point we would all happily give up our atheism and begin examining what would doubtless be the biggest discovery in human history. He then goes into the objective morality bogosity. Quote, There is no morally good atheist because there really is no objective morality. At best, morality is the mass delusion shared by humanity protecting us from the cold sting of despair. You'd think that a pastor would at least have done a modicum of research on this. He hasn't even gotten past Euthyphro's dilemma. In reality, it's his morality that's subjective, since it's solely the product of minds. Either it's from the mind of God if his religion is right, or if it isn't, it's the product of the people who made up the religion and wrote the Bible and the rest of Christian dogma. Only a moral code with a rational basis could, by definition, be objective. We value things like generosity and compassion because we can objectively examine the benefits. Religious people only come along after this and ascribe this to a God, which tells you nothing about why these things are actually good and doing so opens the doors to atrocities like the hatred of homosexuals. See, the way it works is, that natural morality that we have, that moral compass, that little voice that tells you right from wrong, what the religious ascribe to God, really divides people into the we and the not we. And the voice only works with the we. Anyone who's the not we, you can rape, you can torture, you can kill. In World War I, they didn't fight Germans, they fought Krauts. In World War II, they didn't fight Japanese, they fought Japs. And in Korea and Vietnam, they were the Gooks. Just like racists refer to blacks by the N-word and so on, racial and ethnic epithets are bad because they put this entire group of people into the not-we, and our internal moral system doesn't get turned on when we're dealing with them. By condemning homosexuality, the Bible has placed homosexuals into the not-we, and that's why Matthew Shepard was killed. As Voltaire said, those who can make you believe absurdities can get you to commit atrocities. 
whereas one of the main goals of the Enlightenment was to get people to expand their sphere of concern to cover all humanity, placing everyone into the we so that there are no human beings who are not we. Religion was never any good at this. Christianity didn't unify the world, it divided itself into 30,000 denominations, all insisting that theirs is the right one. He very ignorantly tries to go against the observation of ethologists that morality is the result of evolution in social animals. Quote, So compassion for the dying would be immoral, and killing mentally handicapped children would be moral. Wow, really? A sideways equating with eugenics? Do these people have any original arguments? For the record, evolution says not to kill off what you think think are the weaker members of your species, because they may have other advantages you might need in the future. He even says, quote, Perhaps the most moral action would be men raping many women and forcing them to birth more children. Right, because there aren't any negative consequences of doing that. Sheesh. Really, all he's doing is exposing his own immorality. He honestly can't think of a reason not to kill the handicapped and rape as many women as he can without the Bible. He's a psychopath, and it's his religion that made him one. He even says things that are downright absurd, like, Try making a logical argument that slavery is wrong without presupposing morality. It is impossible. Really? He can't think of any argument as to why slavery is wrong? Guess not, because his Bible even supports slavery in the Old and New Testaments. The only argument he can come up with is human dignity. But what does that even mean? First of all, as we've covered before, if you want to use force against others, the burden of proof logically falls on you. And since all of the arguments for slavery have been soundly debunked, we don't really need to go any further. Once those are gone, slavery becomes quite inconsistent. Who gets to have slaves and who has to be the slaves of others? No matter what grounds for this you might lay out, they are arbitrary and indefensible. Also, Frederick Douglass wrote many logical arguments in support of abolition, as did Lysander Spooner and William Lloyd Garrison. All he's proving here is that he hasn't done his homework on the subject. Heck, anyone who understands Say's Law knows why slavery is bad, not just for the slaves, but for the rest of the population as well, including, ultimately, the slave owners themselves. Quote, All logical arguments for morality assume that human thriving, happiness, and dignity are superior to contrary views. The strict framework of atheism does not allow for those starting points. So any person arguing for one or two would not be a good atheist. That is, he lives in contradiction to the mandates of his worldview. Except, as we saw earlier, Henderson was wrong about all three of his posits, which renders his entire argument bogus. That definitely puts him in the running. Now let's hear from our co-host Tim Dyson. Hello, boys and girls. Lord Hawkeye here again. And my nomination for Idiot of the Year is not exactly a surprising one, but it is definitely deserved. It is a man who has not only kept the wars going, but has somehow silenced the anti-war movement. It is a man who has further deteriorated America's already ailing health care system. And he is a man who has managed to implement policies that would be labeled outright tyranny, and yet somehow he's able to pull it off. Yes, folks, I speak, of course, of Barack Obama. He perpetuates wars and is never called out on it, even by those who ought to. He has said that he can detain Americans indefinitely along with implementing one spy program after another and the media continues to ignore it. Worse yet, he implements a health care program which fell flat on its face right out of the gate and yet people still hold out hope that it will work out. For these reasons, for his vast contribution to America's ill health, both mentally and physically, I hereby nominate Barack Obama for Idiot of the Year. Fitting, Obama took Biggest Bogan Emitter and Idiot Extraordinaire five times, more than anyone else this year, with Krugman second place. Yep, he's definitely in the running. Alright, enough fail for a while. Let's recharge our batteries with something positive. The Silver Clue on Award was given out a record four times this year, and here's hoping the win keeps improving. 
the always wonderful, beautiful, intelligent, and insightful Lacey Green took the first one very early on 18 January for her brilliant takedown of abstinence-only sex education. Then an old favorite of ours, Potholer 54 himself, Peter Hatfield, took it on 13 May for supporting global warming without using the IPCC or computer models. And CNN host Don Lemon took it on 30 September for his explanation of the evidence that convinced him that gun control doesn't work. But by far, the most important recipient was on the 8th of July when it went to none other than Edward Snowden, the courageous whistleblower who gave up his comfortable life in the U.S. to show us the hideous infringements of our privacy that the NSA has been up to, information that is still coming to light and being discussed worldwide. Even though Time Magazine deserves a brickbat for not making him Person of the Year, they named Pope Francis instead. We made him biggest bogan emitter on December 9. Snowden has been recognized by freedom activists worldwide as one of our biggest heroes. And now, an unprecedented fifth recipient snuck in here at the last minute. Apparently, in an effort to bring balance to the universe, right after we stick in one pastor for the Idiot of the Year nomination, another pastor jumps right in to take the silver clue on. Youth pastor Tyler Smither posted on his blog, In the Parlor, what has to be the best statement about homosexual issues made by anyone ever. The way I see it, the time for that debate has long since passed. The stakes are too high now. The current research suggests that teenagers that are gay are about three times more likely to attempt suicide than their heterosexual peers. That puts the percentage of gay teens attempting suicide at about 30-some percent. One out of three teens who are gay or bisexual will try to kill themselves, and a lot of times they succeed. The fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter whether or not you think homosexuality is a sin. Let me say that again. It does not matter if you think homosexuality is a sin or if you think it is simply another expression of human love. It doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? Because people are dying. Kids are literally killing themselves because they are so tired of being rejected and dehumanized that they feel their only option left is to end their life. As a youth pastor, this makes me physically ill, and as a human, it should make you feel the same way. So whatever you believe about homosexuality, keep it to yourself. Instead, try telling a gay kid that you love him and you don't want him to die. Try inviting her into your church and into your home and into your life. Anything other than that simply doesn't matter. Way to go, Pastor Smither. Enjoy your shiny new silver clue on. Invite it into your church and your home and your life and let it continue to be the light to others that you have. But while you're making New Year's resolutions, why not resolve to beef up your online security against hackers? Or protect yourself better from NSA spying? Use LastPass to randomly generate secure passwords and save them in a secure environment using leading encryption technology. More than 30 years of combined development, network security, and user interface experience comes together to give you the most secure password service available. Just go to password.bogosity.tv and sign up. You can install LastPass for free in your browser and start securing all of your website logins. Your passwords are only decrypted on your local machine, and LastPass doesn't have your master password or your encryption keys, so not even that nasty NSA can get a hold of them. Save not only passwords, but also credit cards and other secure forms, and even secure files, and access them from anywhere on the web using your LastPass master password on all your computers running Windows, Mac OS X, or Linux. I even save sensitive information on mine, such as my Bitcoin wallet, my Firefox Sync key, and my PGP private key, all securely encrypted. You can also upgrade to LastPass Premium and get LastPass for mobile, LastPass for applications, and even shared family folders. So secure all of your online data easily. Just go to password.bogosity.tv and download LastPass. Okay, back to the bogus. Blame the first from the forum nominates whoever this stupid woman is. She doesn't seem to have her real name anywhere on her blog, Radical Wind, but that won't stop us from smacking her with brickbats over this unbelievably stupid blog entry entitled, PIV is always rape, okay? 
For those who don't know, PIV stands for penis in vagina, the normal traditional method of heterosexual coitus. And she says it's always rape. Always. No exceptions. And yes, she really means that. Quote, As a rad fem, I've always said PIV is rape, and I remember being disappointed to discover that so few radical feminists stated it clearly. How can you possibly see it otherwise? Intercourse is the very means through which men oppress us, from which we are not allowed to escape. Yet some instances of PIV and intercourse may be chosen and free? That makes no sense at all. Wait, what? You're not allowed to escape intercourse? How about just don't have sex? Okay, you might really be raped, and that wouldn't be your fault. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about women wanting and asking for a penis in their vaginas. She says that is rape, too. You know, for the longest time, libertarians have used a phrase against statists when they don't understand the libertarian position versus the statist position. We say it's the difference between rape and lovemaking. We figured everyone would understand that lovemaking isn't rape, right? Huh, oh boy. Quote, First, well, intercourse is never sex for women. Sex for men is the unilateral penetration of their penis into a woman or anything else replacing and symbolizing the female orifice, whether she thinks she wants it or not, which is the definition of rape. No, it bloody well isn't. The definition of rape is forcing a woman to have sex against her will. And no, she doesn't just think she wants it, she does actually want it. Man, how many times have we seen radfems treat women as though they're far stupider and helpless than any male oppressor? There's no possibility that she actually does want it? Listen to this bit, quote, Intercourse is inherently harmful to women and intentionally so because it causes pregnancy in women. Strange, I've known women who actually wanted to be pregnant. Not just to have a child by adopting or whatever, but going through the whole pregnancy bit. As for contraception, quote, There is no way to eliminate the pregnancy risk entirely off PIV, and the mitigating and harm reduction practices such as contraception and abortion are inherently harmful too. Wow. So now we're into abstinence-only bogosity as well. Quote, It fits. Pregnancy equals may hurt, damage, or kill. Intercourse equals a man using his physical force to penetrate a woman. Intention slash purpose of the act of intercourse equals to cause pregnancy. PIV is therefore intentional harm slash violence. Intentional sexual harm of a man against a woman through penile penetration equals rape. No, she's not kidding. I checked. She's being perfectly serious. And she has a ton of support in the comments. Quote, there is a reason men need to groom us into it, and why this grooming takes so long, because it's grossly violating and traumatizing that we would otherwise never submit to intercourse. Wow. I'm guessing she's never spoken to any 13-year-old girls. If anything, you have to groom them out of being sexual, of understanding the risks involved, and how to maturely approach the subject. Make sure you're sitting down for this one. Quote, the vagina's primary function isn't to be penetrated by a penis, but to eject a baby for birth. They are two muscle tissues slash sphincters pressed against each other to help the baby be pushed out. Penetration of the penis into the vagina is completely unnecessary for conception. What? It's completely unnecessary for conception? Did her parents never explain the birds and the bees to her? Or is that just more grooming? Does she think that humans reproduce by spontaneous parthenogenesis? Okay, women today do have the option of in vitro fertilization, but let's go back to her big reason why PIV sex is rape. Quote, because it causes pregnancy in women. And just what does she think IVF does? Does she think there's somewhere she can go to to make a baby where it just floats in a vat for nine months or whatever? Even reproductive cloning requires a uterus. And how do you equate pregnancy is bad with the purpose of a vagina is to eject a baby for birth? Pregnancy is how you get a baby into the vagina in the first place! Jeez, and she wonders why she can't get many other feminists to side with her. 
It's depressing that she has as much support as she does. As painful as this was, good nomination, blame the first. Now let's hear the nomination from another forum user, R-E-H-W-R. -E I wonder if he's related to the man from UNCLE. Um, anyway, here's his nomination for Idiot of the Year. You've heard the saying, he's the reason for the season. Oh, no, 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 not so. Anything but so. I can't take so right now. Please. This is why Jesus says, this is my body that has been broken for you. Jesus was the law incarnate and broken like the tablets of Moses. But instead of the law being in front of you in stone, Jesus said, let the bread represent the law so you can keep the law in you. And God is actually a pretty nice guy for sticking it out with us the way that he does. He could have wiped us out completely and started over or not even bother at all to continue with humanity. He chose to stick it out with us until mankind has been given every chance to conclude that they're either with him or against him. We celebrate the birth of that dude. Merry Christmas, y'all. Yep, same crap as always. Jesus is the reason for the season, as we celebrate the solstice and put up our pagan yule trees and exchange gifts to celebrate the rebirth of Mithras, as we listen for the hoof prints of Odin's horses on our roof. So once more, Zoe Nation finds himself in the running. By the way, Axial Tilt is the reason for the season. Deal with it. You know, we didn't cover much of them this year, but creationists are still around and they're still up to their old tricks. But it's easy to arm yourselves against the lies and misinformation, or even just learn more about evolution and engage creationists more effectively with actual peer-reviewed sources to back you up. It's all in my book, How Evolution is Scientific. I cover the basics of evolutionary theory and how it is so well supported using the scientific method. It's impeccably sourced with references to the actual scientific material and is arranged using a criteria of what is scientific agreed to by both a prominent science group, the National Research Council, and a prominent creationist group, Creation Ministries International. Using the creationists' own arguments against them, you can see how evolution is scientific, but creationism is not, based on observation, accurate predictions, logic, and evidence. Get answers to common creationist claims, and even a primer on abiogenesis, the start of all life. Get all that and more in my book, How Evolution is Scientific, available at Amazon and on Kindle, EPUB, and PDF as well. Make one of your New Year's resolutions to never be taken in by creationists again. Okay, one more to go before we officially name this year's recipient. Let's hear it from Dave Turkop and Jonathan Loche. So, I'm Dave, and I'm here with uh, John Loche, and we're going to talk about my Idiot of the Year, which I am giving to Paul Mason because he believes that Video games are capitalist propaganda, and they should become socialist propaganda. The challenge is to design a game where instead of being a badass in L.A., you can be a good ass on a communal farm. Because Farmville apparently doesn't exist. <laughs> this guy starts off, I'll just, I'll just quote him. You walk into a village inn, and it turns out the landlord sells swords. You're short of gold, so you pop out and shoot some wolves in your bow and arrow. You add their pelts into the deal and buy the sword. What's this? Skyrim, of course. Okay, so his first example is Skyrim. You need the market to survive in Skyrim. Which, no, that's not true at all. Anybody who's played the game will tell you that. He says, Skyrim is a computer game set in the mythical world of Tamriel, where human intercourse consists of fighting, stealing, magic, and trade. Whether you're here or in the deep space of EVE Online or among the lowlife in Grand Theft Auto V, yeah, I resent that statement, the economics of computer games nearly always resembles early capitalism. Trade, conquest, and ruthless rule bending are, are the source of wealth. Actual human labor and ingenuity almost never. This guy has not played Skyrim or any of the Elder Scrolls games for that matter. Had he done that, you would have known that in Skyrim, you can take up jobs. Mm -hmm. You can cut wood. You can do smithing and sell your goods. You can be a hunter. You can open up your own store. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, that's capitalism. That, that means that's bad. And EVE Online, I... Yeah, sure. There's plenty of examples. You get a Kotaku or whatever, and they'll have... There, the option is there to, to be a jerk. Yeah, but, but I mean, like, there's just so much that you can do. That's part of the reason why it's sort of 
Some people don't like it, like to refer to it as a glorified Excel spreadsheet. The only one here that he even mentions is Grand Theft Auto. Mm-hmm. And, that, and even that, Grand Theft Auto, I mean, there's, you there's like st- legit ways you can make money in Grand Theft Auto. You know? Oh, yeah, there, just, there are legitimate ways that you can make money and buy what you need. It's kind of not the point of it, but at the same time, it's still there. Yeah. He then goes on to say, But what happens if you try to subvert in-game economics? Players in complex online worlds are well used to gaming the game, that is, trying to exploit inconsistencies of the economic model to scam other players. Last year, one player, by bidding up the price of worthless object and then getting his friend to destroy it, almost wiped out all the value of an entire universe. The game's full-time economists, such job exists, spent days unpicking the trades. Okay, I'm going to tell you right now, he doesn't say what game it is. He just says this one example, and he expects you to just believe it. He doesn't give any names or nothing. He just says, well, one time, this happened, and that's why this is bad. Yeah, (laughs) I mean, that kind of sounds like something somebody might do in EVE Online, but again, something crazy happens in that game, like, once a year, and then after, like, the day or two of Oh my god, oh my god, the game is broken. Everything goes back to being normal. Here's the thing. If you don't tell us what game it is, how are we supposed to believe you? For all we know, you could just be pulling this right out of your ass. Exactly. He says, what I am proposing is something different. What if, just as in the Occupy camp, where they try to live despite capitalism, you could live despite the property forms and voracious market econ- economics of a computer game. I, I call nonsense. How many of those people in the Occupy movement love their Apple products? Mm-hmm. Secondly... That's not capitalism, Dave. Oh, yeah, that don't count. That's hipsterism. You don't live despite capitalism. Capitalism is merely voluntary trade. It means voluntary. So if you don't take part, guess what? That's still part of capitalism. Because it's voluntary. Nobody is forcing you to take part. And he goes on even further. With Skyrim, the modding community, techies adept at creating unofficial versions of the game have already done clever things with the economy of Tamriel. One limited the amount of natural resources you can run out of wolves. Another made the money supply finite. A third introduced a banking system so that by saving your hoarded gold, you can increase the supply of credit to other players. Really? You're going with modding? A voluntary thing? None of the examples he gives even is like a a strike against capitalism. That's what I'm saying. (laughs) That's exactly what I'm saying. If it's voluntary, it's capitalism. It's the free market. One is like, the money supply is finite or natural resources are finite. That's one of the basic tenets of capitalism. Exactly. This guy really doesn't know what he's talking about even more. But what if you could choose to play any of these games without trying to gain wealth through conquest, violence, or mercantile capitalist strategy of buying cheap and selling dear? Okay, let me just tell you right now, in Skyrim, you cannot barter like that. So, you've already done screwed up. What if you could pursue a strategy to create things collaboratively outside the market, and give the basic necessities of life away for free. This is a case of somebody who doesn't know what the market is. The market is us. We are the market. And it's just an interaction between people. Would you be able, singly or in groups, to screw the slash and grab economy so badly that you forced it into a transition state beyond destructive competition? What? <laughs> He goes on to say, these are good questions. No, they're not. Because a whole school of economists think what they describe as the basic problem facing us in the real world. And we call those people bad economists. We call those people Paul Krugman. Yes. We call them Keynesians. And they suck. A Harvard Law professor has described how the rise of free stuff, collaborative production... And non-commercial products such as Wikipedia create a glitch within capitalism. Oh my f***ing god. Shane, I apologize, you're going to end up having to bleep a lot of this. First off, you don't use the internet to debunk capitalism. Come on now, that, that wasn't capitalism, that was Al Gore giving us his magic powers or something. The internet is arguably the freest of all markets. 
You don't use the internet to debunk capitalism. Wikipedia was a voluntary thing. Capitalism is based on the voluntary exchange. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, in a networked information economy, he writes, cooperative and coordinated action carried out through radically distributed non-market mechanisms play a much greater role than it did. What? First off, if it's cooperative and it's voluntary, it's still part of the market. I'm sounding like a broken record, but it's still the same thing. He said he then goes on to say free collaboratively made products like Wikipedia potentially kill commercial products in their market. Open source products, even when commercialized, like the Android system that runs on 70% of all new smartphones, can reduce the market share of closed propriety products. And I agree with the... That's why I use Android instead of Apple and their proprietary BS. I, I, don't, I don't want to say it again, but I have to say it again. This is all part of the free market. It's voluntary. They're not making you use it. You have the choice to use it. And guess what? It's competing with a commercial product. That's another part of capitalism. Competition. This is not socialist. This is not communist. This is capitalist. He goes on and says, But most games remain trapped in the economics of their time. They are closed markets with a variety of static business models, most of which involve destroying your opponent, monopolizing designs, or plundering resources. This is not true. This is blatant lying. The challenge is to design a game where the economy can evolve from competition to collaboration. Where instead of being a badass in L.A., you can be a good ass on a communal farm in <laughs> Andalusia. <laughs> oh, God. I, I honestly never thought I'd ever see someone use the word communal farm as a good thing and be serious i mean come on a communal farm really what is farmville farmville has like 10 million people playing it not to pull the elitist card or anything but most of the people who play farmville are people who don't normally play video games and hey even then that's capitalist the guys who figured out farmville found themselves a nice little niche a game where modding goes on within the official product not through unauthorized experimental versions. Um, actually, Skyrim, perfectly official. They release the actual people of Bethesda actually really enjoy when people make mods. They actually um, prepare modding kits for the game for people to mod the game themselves. So, you're a liar. A game where it's possible to refuse the basic Jungian call to adventure in an alien world and instead transform the world you live in. So, Minecraft? These games exist, and they're popular. For many of us, economic reality is already a mixture of the market and something beyond the market. So, the government. What does it even mean, beyond the market? Beyond the market, I guess, would be force. The market is a voluntary exchange between individuals. The fact that this clod doesn't get this is just insane to me. There are even people who play the game and have their own little, like, socialist communes set up within the game world. You know what? They just aren't any fun. Yeah, I mean, you can do stuff like that in the game. You're just not going to accomplish much. And I guess while you're busy doing that, I'll go around and going after treasure and having fun. There's a reason why socialism is not a prominent aspect in video games. Because socialism is not fun. Socialism mm -hmm. does not make for an interesting game. It just doesn't. I, I mean, there's only so much. You, I mean, unless you're playing as the government, maybe that's fun for you if you're a dick. This is just beyond stupid. And it's clearly coming from a guy who doesn't understand what the free market is, doesn't understand what capitalism is. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm not too convinced he even understands video games for that matter. You know what? Just going outside the actual article here, just look at the page that this was on. Look at the picture at the top of the page. The the worst example of generic people playing video games picture I've ever seen. The, the guy on the left looks like he doesn't even want to be there and he's forcing a smile. And the woman on the right is thinking, I wonder what I'm going to spend my paycheck on. You know what? Let's take this even further. I'm going to right-click here, view image. 
and you could do this too. Look at the actual file name. You can see it in the URL. Attractive Hispanic couple playing a video game with handheld controllers via Shutterstock. They're not even trying. <laughs> that is a good enough reason for me to think it's Idiot of the Year. Okay, now, before we announce the 2013 Idiot of the Year, make one more New Year's resolution. Not to be like that schmuck. And actually learn some economics and history. Go to libertyclassroom.com, probably the best single learning resource for history and economics on the web. Libertyclassroom.com teaches U.S. history, Western Civ, and economics from actual university professors. Because I hate to tell you this, but you didn't actually learn that much about these subjects in school, and most of what you did learn was wrong. So check it out. There's lots of free material to get you going, including introductory lectures on all these subjects. And when you're ready to pay for the full site's contents, don't pay full price. Type in the promo code BOGOSITY in all caps and get your first year for just $88. Many have signed up and found it to be the best money they've spent. Lectures are available in both video and audio format, so you can watch or listen to them on your computer, your phone, or tablet, or in your car. Learn at your own pace about the subjects you're interested in and become a more effective debater. Defend freedom better in discussions with friends or online in Facebook, YouTube, or anywhere else. Be able to respond to articles critical of a free society and see right through the rhetoric of politicians and political economists. You'll also get access to lots of supplemental materials and even the professors themselves via the discussion forum and even live video chats. And unlike most of the bores and snores you might have had to endure in 700-seat lecture halls, these professors actually like the subject and are eager to teach you. And you can go even further. On every subject, the professors recommend reliable books and other sources, and more courses are being added all the time. Inform yourself against the myths and propaganda of our society. Visit LibertyClassroom.com, and don't forget that promo code, BOGOSITY in all caps. Okay, the nominations are in and the fat lady's warming up. Now it's time to announce the 2013 Idiot of the Year. And I have to go with Blame the First. That idiot Radfim who's too chicken to give a real name is just light years above everyone else. Denying everything from common psychological drives to even basic biology on a level that not even the creationists could challenge? How could the author of Radical Win not be the 2013 Idiot of the Year? And that wraps up this MMXIII edition of the Bogosity Podcast. Please visit the forums at Bogosity.tv where you can read the show notes and join the discussion on these and other subjects. This podcast is free but not free to produce, so please donate via PayPal or Bitcoin at the top of the Bogosity.tv website or down the right-hand side of the podcast page and give generously to keep this podcast going. And if you'd like to contribute to the podcast, just send a question, statement, news article, or rant to podcast at Bogosity.tv. Put it in an audio file, and if it's good enough, it'll get played right in the podcast. Thanks once more to my co-hosts and contributors, Tim Dyson, Jonathan Lachey, Charles Thomas, and Dave Turcotte. Thanks to forum members T-Dog, Blame the First, and R-E-H-W-R as well for submitting their own nominations. Thanks also to Daniel Wilcox and Jim Babka for joining me earlier this year. And also thanks to all of you who have donated or taken advantage of these promos to help this podcast grow. And for that matter, thank you for just listening because that's what it's all about. We'll be back January 13th with regular podcasts. Until then, here's a quote from Harry Brown. Once you learn that you must earn the love and respect of others, you'll never expect the impossible, and you won't be disappointed. The Bogosity Podcast is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Drives 3.01 Ported License. Bogosity. Like, who even bothers to keep that as the URL of a photo? Ugh, that's just beyond silly. Yeah. Paul Mason, you're a moron.